Next up is, is the keynote speaker. Uh, in choosing a keynote speaker, um, it's important to get someone that's out of the ordinary, um, someone that is not mainstream. Uh, it was for that reason that this year we chose Jordan Muhammad. Uh, while some of you might not recognize his name, um, Jordan Muhammad is a film director. Uh, his best work is perhaps Manic, uh, a film starring Michael Bacall and Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Um, it was a hard-hitting drama uh, about a group of troubled juveniles. Um, it all takes place in a psychiatric ward. Uh, the film received uh, critical acclaim by um, the Sundance Film Festival, the Toronto Film Festival, um, and it's a great movie if you want to take a look at it sometime. The rest of his story, um, I was going to let him tell, but on Tuesday he phoned me and said he could not come to the conference, and I said, this is bad news, the conference is in two days, um, who am I going to get for a keynote speaker? So he says, my dad. And I said, your dad, what's he ever done? <laughs> um, with that, he said, it's impossible to say in a few minutes what he's done, but uh, suffice it to say, he's the father of the financial futures industry. Uh, he began as a lawyer um, and to uh, help pay for his existence and his family's existence. He took a job as a runner on the exchange floor. Um, from that, he eventually became a lawyer and um, maintained his relationship with the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Indeed, he rose to the level of chairman in 1969. Um, from his beginning in produce futures, he moved over and created the first financial futures contracts. Uh, many of you are aware that the first financial futures contract were currency futures in 1972. Um, he had to create an entire division of the exchange to trade them, the international monetary um, exchange, uh, international monetary market. Um, from currencies, he moved over to interest rates, introduced the first short-term interest rate contract, uh, the ill-fated treasury bill contract. Uh, ill-fated, I say, because in 1981, he introduced the euro-dollar futures contract, which just swamped it in terms of its efficiency um, and its, its power. Um, that was uh, the first cash settle contract, another innovation. Uh, 1982, my favorite, uh, he introduced the stock index futures contract, the S&P 500 futures. Uh, today it's the most actively indexed uh, futures contract traded in the world. Uh, it trades electronically, it trades 24 hours a day. And in fact, um, through the night people monitor that particular contract in order to understand where the market is going to open, stock market is going to open on the following day. At that point I interrupted Jordan and I said, well, I think you'll be okay. Um, <laughs> Um, with that said, I'd like to introduce Leo Malamud, uh, Chairman Emeritus of the CME Group. Thank you, Robert. That was probably <clears throat> the finest uh, introduction I have ever had. And I will certainly uh, um, thank my son for uh, calling me the other day and asking me if I could uh, pinch it. Uh, I'm here maybe because I'm a good friend of Bob Mertens and Myron Schultz and Bob Schiller, but I'm really here because I owe Hans Stoll. Uh, he, I'm late in the debt, Hans. It's 20 some years later. But in 1987, when the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and that index contract called S&P Futures that Bob spoke about just a minute ago was under attack, we had, of course, caused the 1987 crash. Everyone knew it because everyone had gone with John Phelan, the chairman of the New York Stock Exchange, to the top of the building of the New York Stock Exchange and pointed west. <laughs> Proof enough? It was touch and go whether after the hearings and all that came down on us at the Merck whether there would ever be a 
futures contract. Um, and whether this was the end of uh, financial futures, maybe. I came to Hans. I needed, I needed people of his stature, of his ability, of his credentials, to take a look at what happened and tell the world. He wasn't alone. I went to a lot of people, but Hans among them. And the studies that he, Merton Miller, and others produced proved to the world, to the Congress, that no, no, it wasn't the fault of the futures market. And so that debt is now paid. <laughs> I'm here. And I was just say, telling uh, the chancellor that as I saw that I was invited to be keynote speaker, I believe that that uh, allows a certain privilege um, that is the choice of remarks. And since you're going to be hearing about innovation uh, for the rest of the day, and perhaps I will get a chance to even participate in those conversations. I wrote something else um, and did it rather quickly the last couple of days. And I thought that this was the right form and the right group of people to hear this. Because there is no way to sugarcoat what is happening. Current economic conditions have the earmarks not only of a severe U.S. recession, but dare I say it, the potential of a global depression. That is about as dire as it can get. However, for me, as tragic and ominous as that prospect may be, it does not represent the worst consequence of today's global economic conditions. I fear in the law of selective gravity, selective gravity, that is a cousin of one of Murphy's laws, which postulates that an object will fall so far as to do the most damage. As the world knows, a couple of weeks ago, Treasury Secretary Henry Paulson asked Congress to approve a $700 billion rescue of the banking industry. Without this sudden massive infusion of federal cash, we were told, economic disaster loomed. Prompt approval, on the other hand, would assure the solvency of the financial sector, thaw frozen credit flows, and give investors a badly needed dose of confidence. Faced with the prospect of rising unemployment, a plunging stock market, and the inability of corporate America to borrow, Congress approved a revised package on Friday, October 2008. This gave investors the weekend to contemplate the economic value of the federal action. Were it able to inspire some confidence and halt the momentum or, of, or two of the bloodletting, one might be a bit more charitable in assessing the panic-driven action by the captains of American capitalism. On Monday, as we all know, the stock market plunged into an abyss and the turmoil spread to Europe, Asia, in South America. The plan which Secretary Paulson and Federal Chairman Bernanke told us we must approve to prevent a market crash did nothing of the sort. The market crashed. Now the plan is for government to rescue the banks with direct capital investment whether they want it or not. 
Did anyone ever think that maybe the market doesn't want any more government help? But don't miss the point. I am not lamenting the fact that the desperate plan did not have an immediate medicinal effect. In all reasonableness, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, TARP, will take time to take effect. But what I am lamenting is the fact that the executive branch of an American administration was so desperate that it proposed a res rescue operation of gargantuan proportion, which gave it unlimited power with minimal oversight, little accountability, no recourse, and no judicial review. That's right. That's what those three pages given to Congress said. I'm lamenting the mindset that would devise such a plan. Surely its blueprint had a Venezuelan origin, a plan that Steve Chapman of the Chicago Tribune described as giving the executive branch powers that a Russian czar would envy. I am lamenting the fact that hardly anyone paid the slightest attention to a warning by a group of 122 economists, including at least two Nobel laureates, who stated, and I quote, if the plan is enacted, enacted its effects will be with us for a generation. For all their recent troubles, America's dynamic and innovative private capital markets have brought the nation unparalleled prosperity, fundamentally weakening those markets in order to calm short-run disruptions is desperately short-sighted." I am lamenting that the U.S. government officials were in such a state of panic that they abandoned market solutions in favor of third world sorcery, like blaming speculators and banning short selling. I'm lamenting the fact that all the world's capitalists have turned to the government for salvation. I'm lamenting the fact that federally inspired rescue operations were so quick to surrender the fundamental free market principle that mistakes by the private sector must be borne by the people who made them. As Thomas Donlin of Barron's remarked, the U.S. and Europe are racing down the trail marked by such economic leaders as Mexico, Argentina, and Russia. Or, as Yale's Jonathan Macy put it, Officials at the Federal Reserve, the Securities and Exchange Commission, and the Treasury Department are to blame for publicly losing confidence in the very economic system they are supposed to protect. Above all, what I am lamenting is that the real cost of these operations, what that will be, and not in terms of billions of dollars to the American taxpayer. I am lamenting the fact that the law of selective gravity will result in the unthinkable, the renunciation of the free market. With that, America will lose its most precious asset, the ability to innovate. This is not some fantasy of a historic, hysterical pessimist with a propensity for paranoid prophecies. I like that alliteration. <laughs> <laughs> the developing underlying blame within the walls of Capitol Hill, Wall Street, and Main Street is that the economic disaster is the result of a laissez-faire deregulatory mentality. Greed on Wall Street has become the conventional theme of both presidential candidates. In the public vernacular, that is shorthand for the free market. 
I was a free market guy, but no more, is a common refrain heard from ordinary folks on the streets of America. Its damning echo is resonating throughout the pages of American newspapers, radio talk shows, and TV programs. And it is a message roundly applauded by every enemy of freedom on the planet. This is not to suggest that the financial system is not in trouble or that some form of federal action was unwarranted. Nor is this an attempt to absolve the private sector from blame. Surely, greed played a major role in what happened. Clearly, financial institutions in their rush for greater immediate returns, irrespective of consequential long-term risks, were guilty of irresponsible behavior or much worse. As Randall Forsyth of Barron suggested, over-the-counter structured investment vehicles became the financial equivalent of steroids. Regulatory reform, as suggested by Arthur Levitt, is necessary pertaining to lending practices, licensing standards, oversight of mortgage brokers, capital requirement for monoline insurer, insurers, and transparency in the over-the-counter derivatives so that risks associated with all forms of structured investment vehicles will be fully disclosed. Similarly, as Gary Becker suggested, there is a need for increased capital requirements relative to assets uh, in, of banks in order to prevent the highly leveraged ratio of assets to capital in financial institutions. I agree. But while endorsing regulatory reform, allow me also to draw attention to one place, one place, where in stark contrast to the turmoil of recent events, the market system operated flawlessly. I speak of the futures markets, an indispensable component of the global marketplace. Yes, where the currency futures are traded, the treasury futures in euro dollars are traded, where S&P stock index market are traded. While the growth in the last decade of exchange traded futures was substantially less than in over-the-counter derivatives. Last year, the CME Clearinghouse cleared more than two billion futures contracts representing more than a quadrillion dollars in value. That's a stunning, stunning figure when you consider that in 1972, at the launch of financial markets, the total volume in futures worldwide was one million contracts. Worldwide is a euphemism. It was only the United States that had a futures market. But during this turmoil, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange alone is averaging something on the order of 20 million contracts a day. I'll let the statistician figure out what that represents in growth. Which begs the question, how did exchange traded futures perform during these unprecedented turbulent conditions? The answer is clear. Flawlessly, no defaults, no failures, no federal bailouts. The futures markets model is a poster child for the free market and for innovation. Price transparency, 
liquidity, central counterparty clearing, twice daily mark to the market, zero debt system, and regulatory oversight. Two examples. On March 14, 2008, the last day before Bear Stearns was acquired by J.P. Morgan, Bear Stearns held, get this, $761 billion in notional value in open futures contracts for customers and house accounts at the CME, $761 billion worth of contracts. All positions were paid for and settled. No problem. Impressive, yes? How about this? On Friday, September 12, 2008, the last weekday before Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy, the total notional value of customer and house positions at the CME by Lehman was $1.15 trillion. No defaults, no failures, no federal bailouts. Unabated, futures market continue to perform their essential functions, create a value for price discovery, permit low-cost hedging for risk, and innovate. But here's the rub. The free market model cannot function when it is directed, or better still, misdirected by the heavy hand of government edict. No matter how one views what happened, no matter of what political persuasion, much, if not most, of its causation has a governmental origin. First, because during the past decade, the world became awash with liquidity. Low interest rates engineered by world central bankers caused interest rates, especially in the U.S., to fall to the lowest level in a generation. The consequential cheap money, when combined with loan syndication and securitization, produced some highly unintended consequences. A mortgage lending boom ensued, and bankers found ever more clever ways to repackage trillions of dollars of loans. Bob Schiller summed it up this way. The housing bubble is the core reason for the collapsing house of cards we are seeing in financial markets in the U.S. and around the world. This leads us to the second and most egregious culprit of the financial collapse, two government-sponsored enterprises, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. They were viewed in the market correctly, as it turns out, as government-backed buyers. These two GESs were on an affordable housing mission, becoming the largest buyers of subprime between 2004 and 2007, with a total exposure exceeding $1 trillion. It was a mission supported and backed by elected congressional officials who presented themselves as champions of affordable housing. A laudable cause. It fostered the so-called ninja loans to borrowers. Ninja, no income, no job, no assets, it's okay. And poisoned the global financial system. The Fannie Mae Freddie Mac bailout, wrote the Wall Street Journal, is one of the greatest political scandals of our age. Officials at the Federal Reserve warned about it for years, only to be ignored by both parties of Capitol Hill. In other words, 
it was a rigged game. The dictates of the free market are always stymied by a monopoly, a cartel, or the actions of government. It would be a tragic misdirect and a perverted leap of logic if the conditions that caused the global meltdown, the transgressions that occurred within the private sector, or the regulatory reforms that are now required were blamed on the precepts that made this nation so great. More than any other nation on this globe, Americans are free to think, to experiment, to innovate as the Chancellor said. It is a legacy of the free market, a story of two miracles, an economic miracle and a political miracle. Its application by a people of an immigrant ancestry, of a multicultural heritage, and a multiracial composition produced an unimaginable result. It became a lightning rod for ideas. It created a crucible for innovation. It combined to become the decisive driver of progress in science, technology, and economic development. I pray that my fear is misplaced. But Murphy's Law demands that I sound the alarm. Thank you very much.